Very good morning to everyone and welcome to the National Library's signature program for Conversations. My name is Mervyn from the National Library's engagement team and your MC for the morning. There is always something new to discover at the National Library where we seek to ignite a passion for learning through our collections, services and programs just like this. Four Conversations is an annual program where we bring together thought leaders to share new possibilities for the future, inspire lifelong learning and the creation of new knowledge based on the theme of new thinking for a new world. This year, we are pleased to have with us speakers who are drivers of innovation and who have impacted society through technology. Our first speaker for this morning session is Mr. Charlie Ang. Charlie is a business futurist who specializes in analyzing, imagining, and explaining the future, especially on how technology will impact, disrupt, and empower businesses, industries, professions, and economies. He is also the founding president of the Innovators Institute, the ambassador of Singularity U Singapore, the local chapter of Singularity University, as well as an adjunct advisor at the International Data Corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Charlie Ang. Very good morning to all of you. Uh, what an awesome turnout on a Saturday morning. I struggle to wake up on a Saturday usually. So uh, I'm actually a very big fan of the NLB, having benefited immensely over the years since I was a young child and, you know, going to library and to queue up to get your book stamp, right? For those of you who are old enough to remember. So I'm really honoured to be uh, invited by them to share with you my perspective about the future. Um, even up to today, uh, I've been an active user of NLB resources and beneficiary of their innovation. Um, I'm using the mobile app. For those of you who haven't tried, it's amazing. You can down. For me personally, I've downloaded the audio books, you know, and on an instant, and I can listen to the books on the go. So I'm I'm kind of uh, having to catch up and stay up to speed with the future trends, future thinking, uh, you know given that the world is moving, moving very fast. So can we give NLB team a great hand, uh, a hand for their great work. Thank you very much. Okay, so I will dive in with my topic uh, of making sense of the disruptive future. I'm sure uh, this topic, I think, I don't have to explain why it's very important. The world is becoming a lot more disruptive. Um, so This is a he very heavy topic, uh, but it's a topic I've been very passionate about for the last six years. Uh, so before I start, I really want to understand this audience better. Uh, this session is not about me, it's all about you. So please raise your hand if you are one of these, uh, you are playing one of these roles. Uh, that you are, for instance, uh, you are a working professional. Okay. You are an uh, entrepreneur. Okay, you are a uh, student. <laughs> We're all students, right? Okay, uh, if you are a parent, like me, all right? If you are a grandparent, nice. If you are a great-grandparent. <laughs> so, uh, and if you are investor of any financial assets other than your own home, you buy stocks, you know, you, you, you buy various financial products, real estate. Okay, good. So every time you raise your hand, I want to remind you that these are the different roles that you play, right? And when we talk about the future, uh, it's not just, you know, whether you're just looking at your job or your career, but actually it plays uh, to your multiple roles that you play. For instance, I'm always constantly thinking about my two girls, they are primary four and primary five now, and how would they... Uh, take advantage and benefit from the future economy, right? Okay, so I, today's theme is a four conversation. So I've structured my presentation with four, uh, in four segments, I call it the four F. So the uh, first F is giving you a framework, a very simple framework that we can all use to conceptualize and understand the future. So this is a two-dimensional uh, chart and at one end, you have probability of an event, whether it's low probability or high probability. And then on the 
x axis you have uh, impact, low impact or high impact. So what we are concerned about is not the low impact events. These are noise that happen every day, right? So we are interested to know uh, events that can really change the world, change all of us. So on 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 the high impact, high probability is something called mega trends. Okay, which I will dive in later on. And on the left hand side are black swans. These are unpredictable events that we can only justify after the event has happened. Uh, so if you are looking forward, you know you may think of certain events that will only have one or two or three percent chance of happening. Um, so there are actually a lot of these potential black swans, and I'll also talk about this later on. So how do we deal with this? Uh, Mega trends. These are all very well known trends that is happening, is predictable, and what we have to do is to prepare for this shift ahead of time. Obviously, you want to be taking advantage and uh, be ahead of your peers or in ahead of your uh, business competitors, right? So you want to prepare for it ahead of time. So this is what I call you need to be have that proactivity. On the left hand side. It's very unpredictable events. So what happened is that all of us need to have an early warning system, a radar system to anticipate, detect, and when it happens, to react accordingly. So this is called agility. So today, actually, many of these uh, black swans are technological black swans. So there will be more and more and more technological black swans, things that we have not seen coming, we have, we, we, it's not in our kind of uh, uh, a whole list of anticipations, right? This, this can come out of, of the blue and this can actually change everything. So I want to start uh, this interaction okay, with this very simple poll. Okay? Now we are talking about technological black swan or so-called disruption. So I have a list of eight items over here um, and I want to get a sense, all of you should just raise your hands once, you know, which of these eight areas has been disrupted the most in the last, last decade, okay? So I'll go round the list, who thinks that is a retail, your shopping, your e-commerce, your brick and mortar stores, okay? That easily is like one quarter already. Advertising? Couple of hands up. Transport. Your Airbnb, sorry, your your Uber, right? Usually the name comes to mind. Your travel, your booking, your airlines. Okay, a few more hands. Media. Wow, this is again another quarter. Anyone thinks that energy has been heavily disrupted? Energy. One. Politics. Okay, a couple more. Some seems to have raised your hands a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Finance, money. Okay, a few, a few, a few, a few. Okay, so I'm, I'm here to share with you some unconventional wisdom. Um, and I firmly believe that in the last 10 years, okay, energy and politics has been heavily, heavily disrupted. Um, I'll go down the list. Energy first. Do you all know why energy is today... Uh, the price is about $60, $70, at one time dipping to $30. And just roll back maybe 10 years ago, we are talking about 100 150 even peak oil at like $200 over dollars. Sorry? Shell oil. That's a... Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's, a, that's, that, that's the exact correct answer. Um, actually, most people are not familiar with this concept. And this concept of advanced fracking, basically allowing uh, companies to drill oil uh, through this fracking method, which means that you drill vertically down and then after that you drill horizontally and you use water to break up the rocks. This is called advanced fracking. So during Obama, uh, President Obama's term, eight-year term, America actually doubled its oil output using advanced fracking. So as you know, America, in fact, 
most of the world has been uh, very thirsty for Middle East oil, right? So in this span of eight years, America suddenly do not need external oil anymore. In fact, uh, President Donald Trump in this year's State of Union, he claimed obviously America has reached uh, oil energy independence for, for a long, long time. And that's credit to this technology. So uh, what has actually changed since then? Because of this technology, actually $1.7 billion of uh, oil and gas uh, companies in terms of the market cap has been wiped off the market. Uh, you know, you see a lot of big companies in those days in the top 10, top 100, yeah, all oil and gas companies. Uh, you look at, for instance, in Singapore, some companies in this area, uh, Semcorp, and the capital, you know, and the whole cluster of offshore marine companies has all been disrupted because of this. Um, but if you look at another level, I'll tell you the entire, entire economies, the oil exporting economies, actually has been heavily disrupted by this. Uh, why today uh, at the fifty, sixty dollar oil price, actually many of these uh, oil exporters, right, in the Middle East even Russia, even our neighbours, Malaysia, heavily impacted by this. And if you are to project it one level up, you look at what actually is happening around the world today. Why is there this concept of America first? Because the American economy, by and large, only 12% is export-related. And of this 12%, half is uh, within this North, Afri North American continent. Right. So America is actually one of the large economies that is very independent on the rest of the world. The only dependency it has is actually Middle East oil and gas. So guess what? By being energy independent, they no longer need that flow of energy import from Middle East. So the game has totally changed and that allows America to fully pivot to this part of the world. Um, that's why having this uh, American first policy, in some ways, if you look at it, there's some logic in that. Um, that's enabled by this uh, advanced fracking. And if you look at what's happening just in this Middle East region, right, in the last five, seven years, there's a rise, and then now the fall of ISIS. Uh, you see this uh, sectarian conflict, uh, civil war in Yemen, in fact, proxy wars, I would say in Yemen and Syria, and millions of people displaced and some of them went to Europe. Um, and that's because America has kind of withdrawn and reduced its security cover for the whole Middle East. So what I'm trying to tell you is that just one single technology, you know, you're not just changing an industry or economy, but actually at the highest level, you're transforming entire geopolitics around the world. And I use this article that I wrote a couple of years ago to highlight that the next generation of technologies, right, just now was disruption of energy resources. And the second leg of energy uh, disruption is coming, as you know, uh, electric economy, right, renewable energy, clean tech. Um, but just look at the profound impact of one single technology. And what we are seeing is that the next generation of digital technologies, what I call intelligent technologies that would disrupt human resources. So in the same way that energy can kind of change everything and the way we live, right? The intelligent technologies this time has a potential to disrupt human resources and human resources is what power all countries. Um, so I'm throwing caution to the wind so that we're all aware of this big transformation that's happening. We're not talking about today's technology or yesteryear's technology, what's coming up is really very advanced and very sophisticated, intelligent-based technologies. The second disruption, that's the political disruption, and President Donald Trump himself claimed that he won't be the president without Twitter. You know, his winning margin is quite marginal, right? So without Twitter, he admitted that he won't be the president today. Um, and also similarly for Brexit, half the respondents think that if there's no Brexit, if there's no social media, there's no Brexit. At the same time, also there's Arab, Arab Spring that happened, also technology enabled, and today even Hong Kong's uprising is uh, technology enabled. 
So uh, another case would be the uh, Brazilian president who was like sort of using WhatsApp as the campaigning media and, and he won based on that. So without social media, the world would be so different today. So that's why to me, uh, the political disruption, uh, it's a big black swan enabled by technology. So just, just a quick scan of the black swans over the last, say, 20 years, right? So uh, there's technology enabled black swans. These are the red color. And then there's also uh, environmental black swans, uh, you know, in terrorism related, uh, this geopolitical black swan like 911 Gulf Wars, as well as financial black swans. So there will be acceleration and the creation of many, many black swans as we, as we move ahead. So mentally, we have to have the agility, you know, to be able to comprehend and react to these black swans. So now I want to talk about the second thing, the second F, fast approaching mega trends. In fact, in many ways, I would say they are here already. If you flip the papers today, they are all talking about four mega trends. Okay. So I want to start with this chart. And if you don't remember anything from me today, at least remember this particular chart. It's so, so important. So what happened is that in the last 30 years, since 1990, okay, uh, we are so-called in humanity, we're actually in one volume of humanity and we are actually uh, at the last pages of this humanity and moving to a new volume. So this year, we are going to the next decade, right? It's very important that we know what is happening and I want to trace back to 1990, uh, what I call the One World Order. And Actually, there's one very important event that happened around 1990 that sort of allows us to start to write on these four mega trends up to today. Uh, can I ask you about what is this big event? Sorry? The internet? Globalization? Okay. Internet globalization is one of the four mega trends. But there was one particular event that occurred. In fact, to many people at that time, you know, Black Swan again is something that you can only rationalize after the fact. Before that, people don't see it coming. Even the experts don't see that coming. So there's one huge mega trend that happened. And when it happened, that kind of underwrote the four mega trends that just now you mentioned the internet is part of it, globalization is part of it. But what is that? Mega trend. Sorry? Yes, that's, that's exactly. I, in fact, I, I find that people struggle to answer this. But I remember those days when it was, I mean, I'm old enough to remember the pre and the post Cold War period. Um, and basically, the whole fall of Berlin Wall, right? That's in 1989. In fact, even the case of Tiananmen, it was actually 1989, and it's all related to this kind of end of communism, right? And because of that, the whole world, before that, the whole world was in two pieces, right? There is the Western liberal order, and then there is the uh, Warsaw Pact, you know, Eastern uh, communist countries, right? Because of this collapse of the Cold War, we suddenly collapsed into one world, and as uh, some of you mentioned, you know, globalization, uh, urbanization, not in Singapore, we are fully urbanized, but in large countries, right? We move from that small pockets of people being urbanized to now uh, the majority of humanity uh, in urban cities. And, and, and the rollout of internet, mobile technologies, and obviously uh, China was kind of riding on this, yeah, this, this, this whole uh, integration into the world economic system. Generally, these are positive trends, right? Do you agree that? These are positive trends and that underwrote the growth of our country, our region and, and the rest of the world for the last 30 years. Unfortunately, uh, sad to say, many of these trends are coming to an end. 
okay and now we are moving from these four mega trends okay shift your focus if you are still thinking about this you are kind of a bit beh behind the game now i want you to switch you to the new four mega trends so before that this uh old mega trends they are running like a s curve they are still running its course but it's slowing down right just look at for example globalization actually there's some reversal of globalization trade war is a reversal of globalization brexit is another example right um so these trends are still there but running and slowing down just look at china's growth right the gdp is kind of dipping right it cannot grow at 10 percent all the time so it's actually slowing down so let me ask you and i'm sure the wisdom of the crowds today or wisdom of the citizens today can help us answer this and what is the next four mega trends okay okay i'll say that is a sub trend i have a, I have a higher level trend but that's very important observation i i could put that in the fifth or sixth item but it's not in my four what should be top of our mind right now yes okay i'll put that under the technology bucket which i call fourth industrial revolution okay so that would capture everything to do with technology the ai the robotics the blockchain and all this transformation that's happening social media the next version of social media or immersive reality okay technology absolutely so it should be top of our mind right climate change climate crisis or climate collapse whatever you want to call it so climate is a big part of the environmental tr uh, disruption so i have technology disruption environmental disruption there are two more disruptions yes aging uh, demographic disruption happening as we speak in our family in singapore uh, in developed countries and that will have a profound impact on basically investments and economies around the whole world and the only place that are kind of growing is uh, developing countries and that also bring up and kind of uh, herald the rise of the emerging and developing countries relative to the developed countries what is the one more uh that 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 is part of the climate environmental part each one of them are something huge huh? they, you you can have uh, sub trends inside financial i'll say that, that that is one aspect that's one aspect but again a big part of this is uh, they are a combination of these few mega trends coming together just look at the uh maybe i give you a hint uh, just look at the trade war the technology war a bit of the technology war trade war and technology war between china and us right what 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 is that again that 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 technology is covered yes 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 so it's the new what i call the new geopolitical disorder unfortunately i like to call uh so so let me help you to understand the larger longer term picture before the two world wars the world is multipolar okay there's the the germans the british empire the japanese the americans you know it's a multipolar world we took the two world wars to collapse into two superpowers right and then after the end of the cold war we become a unipolar so multipolar to bipolar to unipolar this unipolar moment will never repeat again okay this is a absolute unusual operation in history you will not not happen in our lifetime or even in in distant future okay and so we are transitioning into a bipolar world and by 2030 you will see the for instance some reports estimates that indonesia will be india will actually become the second largest economy in the world by 2030 based on ppp terms overtaking america and indonesia will become the fourth so the world will become an eu is still there russia is still there us china is still there so this will become hyper uh, fragmented 
a multipolar world. And in this multipolar world, all the more multilateralism is needed. Right? Today we just uh, heard this morning you know, PM talking about importance of multilateralism at UN. So each one of them, I would say, are very profound and deep transformation. Okay? The frightening thing is that they are all happening at the same time. So that adds to the kind of complexity we are dealing with. You look at the technology revolution and the, pol the geopolitical competition. That's why you have the technology war, right? So just let me just mention a bit about the geopolitical transition. So imagine uh, in the past, there's one big sun, okay? And there's a lot of planets circulating around this sun. And this sun is America, right? And then one of the largest planets keep uh, absorbing the energy from this sun until someday it becomes a sun by itself, a smaller sun. So from a single sun solar system, now we have a dual star solar system. And the largest sun is trying to pull itself away from the smaller sun. And for the rest of us, we have to find our place in this new celestial order, right? We have to decide whether we want to rotate around the larger sun, the smaller sun, or in the geopolitical, so-called gravitational flux in the middle, so-called non-aligned. So these are all the issues that is surfacing, you know, um, and, and just let me emphasize that in the next few years, there will be a few more suns coming up. So it will be a more level playing field, but that also adds to the complication that we will see the rise of geopolitics geopolit again. In the last 30 years, geopolitics was never an issue. Everything is smooth and relatively peaceful, except from for some of the Middle East conflicts, right? But today, all of us, this should be also a top of mind because it will affect all of us at different, different levels. I think climate crisis, you just look at it, right? I always say this, okay? Uh, we don't believe in change until we see it. Okay, I can be telling you all these things that's happening until we are impacted by it. You don't be actually believe in it, right? But the paradox of that is that if you see and believe, if you believe only when you see it, unfortunately, it's too late to react. So what happened is that actually you, you have to prepare before it happens, okay? But because we don't believe until it happens, then we only prepare when it's too late. So the purpose of such session is actually to draw your mind, help you visualize what will happen so you prepare for it today. So just look at climate crisis. We actually, we have, uh, uh, Al Gore has been talking about it since, I think, 1980s. Right? It's not something that is like very recent. But we don't believe it until we see it. And this is the year we actually see it, right? Record heat wave. I was speaking to an audience of like, international audience and I joke that you know for the first time in history the Europeans can come here to escape the heat because they, they're having 42 degree heat wave right and then you have droughts in Mumbai South Africa Chennai I'll say and then different Amazonian fires and even now it's the back of this uh, haze in our region right so today it's top of the mind and it's kind of a really time to respond in, in fact some would say that this is a climate emergency. So uh, we've been talking about it. Now is really the moment uh, to be taught of our mind. And, and this uh, rapidly, this uh, growing population, I think this is no surprise to all of us. This is the most predictable of the four trends. But again, it's a whole baby boomers. Uh, you know, they, they boom after the, the, the World War, right? And then there's plenty of them. And now they're all retiring at the same time. So if you look at e economics, in terms of the workforce, there's a big dip in terms of the workforce and even the Singapore economy, local workforce is starting to decline because many of them are retiring in my family as well. Right? So we can see it all happening and they stop working and, and basically the economic growth and productivity is being challenged. So today, I hope I at least can help you switch to these four uh, new mega trends and whatever you do today, think about these four because uh, the importance and the speed of this kind is uh, accelerating in terms of the trends of this becoming a reality. So at the same time, we're also moving to 3.0 to 4.0 economy. Okay, I will uh, explain that deeper when I go 
to uh, one of the next segments. So if uh, I come from this place called Singularity University, I'm actually the ambassador for Singapore. I attended their program in uh, 2013. And one of their signature uh, idea is this concept of exponential change. So humans don't think exponentially, we think in a straight line, you know. We think that change will happen in a very systematic, straight kind of pattern. But that ne never happens because uh, technology and changes actually rides on another curve. And this curve is an exponential curve. It means that uh, the changes happen slowly, 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 and then happen suddenly. And, you know, the, the, the point of crossing the straight line is where the aha moment that is here already and is suddenly kind of changing the world. And this is the same pattern that it disrupted many, many industries. It's like the iPhone moment, no? Uh, when iPhone came out, suddenly all the other players will wipe out because it rides on this exponential trend. So AI was here for the last like 40, 50 years and suddenly it's going exponential, it's becoming production, it's becoming real. So just now the four mega trends, you can uh, posture it according to this S-curve. Okay, So it's these trends that is dying out as well as the new trends that are going exponential. Okay, uh, The factors are still in play, um, but you need to know which one to focus on now. So uh, there's this term called VOCA, I'll show you in the next slide, and then we are becoming uh, going into a hyper VOCA environment. So this is what I hear in the boardroom, round table, and coffee shops nowadays. Totally unprecedented, extremely uncertain, highly disruptive, very complex. We simply do not know what to do next. Any one of you has said something like that recently? I hear it all the time, I say it all the time. And I've been telling people this is coming. This is the kind of hyper-disruptive world we are coming to. In fact, you can use that to describe any macro situation that's happening right now. But you can also use the same adjective uh, for any one of these major incidents, or so-called black swan that's playing out. The Hong Kong popular uprising. What will happen uh, in the next weeks? Maybe we have some one or two flashpoints away from many, any of this becoming a full-blown crisis. Okay? Whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's Brexit, whether it's a US-China trade war, even the Middle East is a potential flashpoint uh, between Saudi and Iran. And also, out of the blue, there's a US presidential impeachment. Right? Um, so, Right now, there's so much uncertainty. Each one of them, again, has profound impact. Um, but don't look at this negatively. There's uh, upside and there's downside. Singapore, we have to play to the strengths. If you look at uh, currently, you know, Brexit is the second largest, UK is the second largest financial hub in the world. Hong Kong is number three. Singapore is number four, right? So we have to kind of seize the moment and uh, take advantage of anything that happens around the world. So also, if you look into press right now, this is not just for Singapore impending uh, slowdown, if not recession, uh, but we're already seeing you know, massive slowdown in Germany, export-oriented economies like South Korea as well. Uh, so these are, in a way, building up to the next decade, the next few decades, and all these different trends that I mentioned just now. So. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of this very business term and it had its days in uh, starting from the military roots. Uh, VOCA, that's volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. Right? Uh, this is good to explain the world up to today. If you use the same adjective, then we are kind of underestimating what is coming up. I like to add two words in front. That is disruptive. That is the creative destruction of the way we do things today and how five, ten years away it will be different, right? Just think of five years ago, how do you order a taxi and how do you do it today? Um, as well as just now, I show you the exponential trend. 
the four things are not taking their own sweet time to happen. It's accelerating in terms of uh, you know, how they are interacting with one another and adding so much complexity and transformation in the world. I'll look at at least the next 30 years, all these trends playing out. But technology is a never-ending trend, I would say. Uh, so a very famous uh, futurist, uh, he said humanity will change more in the next 20 years than the last 200 years. So that is the kind of acceleration of change we are going through, and I firmly believe in this. In fact, some industries, I work with organizations from many industries. For example, insurance industry hasn't changed its model for the last 200 years. In the next 10 years, it will totally be reinvented. In the automotive industry, you know, you have, they, they, they call it automotive, but it's not auto, you still have a human driver, right? So in the next 10 years, you know it's going self-driving, so it's really becoming your real automobile, really transforming the industry. So now I want to talk about the future, uh, this 4.0, fourth industrial revolution. So this fourth industrial revolution is the fusion of technologies blurring the lines between physical, uh, digital, as well as biological sphere. So the pace of change is at exponential and non-linear pace. It's disrupting almost every industry in every country. And we'll see the transformation of entire value chains. So no stone will be le uh, left untouched. So this topic is something that I've been passionate, very, very passionate about for the last six years uh, because I, in 2013, I actually wrote about the 4.0 model. Okay, and three years later, the World Economic Forum calls this the fourth industrial revolution. So very briefly, I will just touch on what is, uh, how does my model looks like. Again, there's S-curve. So the original industrial revolution happened in the, happened in England, right? So that is the initial foundational technologies of industrialization, especially steam engine. And the second stage happened in America, whereby we are able to fully harness fossil fuels to build large-scale industries powered by electricity. So if you look at economic records and even uh, uh, social records, right, all the boom and the explosion in terms of GDP per capita, uh, in terms of population growth, in terms of people's welfare, it was all really happening in the second stage. That um, led us to, you know, obviously the two world wars because there is this uh, new generation technologies with new generation economy, but our political system are still the old generation, right? So you need this social revolution to take place political revolution, and then we are able to reborn again. And that brought us to where we are today. So in the last 60 years, since semiconductor was invented, the age of computers, we are actually in this first part, the third industrial revolution. Okay, We lived through that, we benefited from this. But this is not disruptive, this is actually putting information in our hands. But what is the challenge with that? The challenge is that we become the bottleneck because no matter how much data I give you, you'll say you have information overload. You cannot process it anymore. Our minds cannot uh, process big data, right? You have collect a lot of data from big sensors. We can't make any sense of it, right? So we become the bottleneck. If you look at productivity growth of organizations or whole economies, right? Um, they are actually, uh, the productivity has been quite, quite marginal, one or two percent. You only see developing countries, you know, catching up the in terms of the, the the ladder escalator of development. So they grow very fast, a lot of productivity. But once they hit the top, like like Singapore, right, you flatten out in terms of productivity. Because right now the thing that's holding us back is the lack of uh, insufficient intelligence. I'll say that's the thing that's holding us back. So what we need to unleash this is to augment and supplement with machine intelligence. Um, if you look at the kind of climate crisis that we have, right, the kind of thinking that we have, the kind of science and technology we have, 
that got us to where we are today, this climate crisis. So we need to really unlock and unleash a lot of uh, non-biological intelligence to help us solve a lot of this world's problem. Today, there are 4 billion people earning $10 or less. Right? So in this room in Singapore, we're kind of fortunate, but there are a lot of people suffering out there. So if you don't use technology, uh, and with this climate change coming already in place, happening, uh, then we'll, we'll see a, a poorer and poorer and more suffering world if we don't use technology to augment what we do. So today, uh, we are at this inflection point. That's why what happened in the next 10 years you know, is equal to what happened in the last 50, 100 years. So what is the most disruptive technology in the next 10 years? In fact, the next five, right? So intelligent-based technology. So I just want to illustrate one particular technology. We all have this in our mobile phone, but just understand that, you know, when technology is new, they are very primitive. A few years later, uh, they can be very powerful and very functional. Just imagine your first digital camera, huge and bulky, right? A few years later, it's just into our phones everywhere, and we can't stop using it. So the the things that companies, the tech giants are not telling you is that they're all betting on this. That's why they call themselves AI first, whether it's Google or Microsoft. Um, our way of decision making up to today, okay, and moving forward, it will change. Okay? Um, and our way of decision making is called, is called heuristics. It means that we have a few data points and we are very efficient with using past experience to help us make future decisions. We are very efficient with that. But then a new paradigm is coming, and the new paradigm is based on big data. It's looking at millions of transactions, millions of faces, millions of you know, traffic signs. And that kind of decision making uh, would actually deliver very, very optimal solutions, answers, uh, decisions to make. Um, you just look at every day, actually, I'm using some form of this, and it's called the, the app. It's called Waze, right? When I'm driving, I'm actually using real-time crowdsource traffic information to help me know when and where I should, kind of, which route I should take and where is my exact ETA, estimated time arrival. So uh, I use it every day because I can't, big, I can't beat the real-time big data and some form of analytical uh, intelligence. Uh, and I'm not just blindly using it, I'm actually combining with it to make better decisions uh, because sometimes I know the app may not work well or there are some tools that I want, to, uh, I want to skip and there's also my own driving preference, right? So that is the kind of uh, machine human level intelligence and in future we'll see experts becoming super experts when AI comes into, into play. Imagine your researchers, your scientists, they will all become a few levels higher, uh, more proficient because they work with technology. So uh, AI system today is like a toy, but in future, a lot of decisions that we make, what we buy, who do we meet, uh, where do we eat, you know, even who do we date, right? AI would kind of help us in many ways. So my fourth, uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution, you'll start with technology 4.0, okay? And then we'll see everything becoming 4.0, and it will look very different. A 3.0 economy with people in the middle and then technology supplementing us, right? This will go into a flip, which means that a lot of the operations or economy will be run by technology, but we need a new kind of talent, okay? A 4.0 talent, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, you know, the technologies the designers, and these are the people who transform the way we work from 3.0 to 4.0 to create a lot more value. So even politics will have 4.0, uh, education will have, we need a 4.0 version. That's why I call my company Everything 4.0. So the fourth F is uh, what does it mean for you, right? So uh, actually I wrote about this at the Singapore level, uh, how as a country we cannot view 4.0 world with 3.0 lenses. We have to really rethink our strategies to lead in this fourth industrial revolution. So we need a radical vision. 
all of us have to understand what AI means for us. It's no longer something you know, managed for us. It will impact us at so many levels. I also wrote about uh, how uh, the fourth generation leadership, what are the challenges involved? And the opportunities is that I think that there's no other country or few other countries are as well positioned as us to take advantage to become a 4.0 nation economy and society. It's actually a very exciting time if you are doing the right thing. So I want to uh, use this quick analogy to help you understand okay, where we are heading towards. Just imagine this elephant that has been operating in this jungle for the last 30 years. That's elephant's home terrain, right? And suddenly, to move forward, the elephant is faced with a deep river in front. After that, a high mountain. After a mountain, is a dry desert. So my question to you is, what is the thing that the elephant has to do so that the elephant can go and navigate and go through the whole so-called obstacle course and progress into the future? Yes? Evolve may be too slow. <laughs> I mean, humans, uh, or this, uh, Life actually takes a long time to evolve. Yes, please give me something. <laughs> yes, I like that. Sorry? New vehicle. Okay. Yes? Okay, so that. Okay, so a vehicle to help this elephant move around. Uh, a car for the elephant or something like that. Okay, being adaptable. Anything else? <laughs> that is one choice that can be made. That's, uh, I mean, for some people, they may choose to <laughs> just uh, survive in the past, right? Okay, so actually this is a trick question because there is no one thing, two thing, three thing, or laundry list of things that uh, the elephant has to do to go through the whole f three or four or five future unknown obstacles. No matter what it does, you'll never survive the first obstacle that's going through the river, right? So it's not about what the elephant has to do, okay? It's about what the elephant has to become. So when the elephant is going through the river, it has to turn itself into a fish. When it's going through climbing the mountain, it has to turn itself into a deer. After that, the in the desert terrain, it has to become a camel. So from one, one single form factor, life form, right? Now you need to become a shape-shifting, what I call organism, which means that you are actually able to change your shape as the terrain transforms. And I can be talking about this at the whole Singapore economy level. Uh, I can be talking about this for organizations as well as I hope a takeaway for you is as an individual because the future terrain will be so different than what uh, has come before. I think we are created to operate in a jungle, but now it's a very unknown terrain ahead of us. So it's no longer about doing what you're doing. Right? That is still important because you live your life. But at the same time, it's also about transformation, transforming how you do things your mindsets, your strategies, your approach. Because if the world moves to a 4.0 model, your job becomes a 4.0 model, and if you're 3.0, you'll never be able to uh, catch up. So we have to also transform ourselves to live in the 4.0 world. So a very uh, famous, in fact, he's the father of all futurists, Elvin Toffler, he passed away a few years ago, and he said this many decades ago. I think it's very hard to understand this in the old context, right? The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So actively, well, you know, we are in a library setting to help us to learn. There's also a lot of old mental models that is becoming very obsolete. And we have to quickly dump that away to adopt new approaches to win in the future. And I also like this quote by Hal Elrod. He said, let today be the day you give up who you have been for what you can become. 
So it's about becoming, it's not about just doing. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I'll invite you to join my community um, in Facebook. And it's something that um, I'm, I'm actively you know, helping to prepare our fellow citizens for the future economy for 4.0 future. So I have my contacts here, feel free to take a photo, get in touch. I also have programs to help PMATs become future ready in their careers. So with that, I'll be on the panel later on, so I'm happy to have a conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ang, for the most insightful sharing. Our next speaker for this session is Professor Jason Pomeroy. Jason is an award-winning architect, academic, author, and TV personality. His career has sp spanned Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, and encompassed a number of notable projects, including the first zero-carbon house and zero-carbon community in Asia, and along with Indonesia's Silicon Valley. Jason also worked to raise awareness of the cultural role architecture plays in society. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Jason Pomeroy. Thanks very much. Good morning. How are you? Good. Are your bums a bit sore? Can you stand up? Stand up. Shake yourself off a bit. Shake yourself off a bit. And I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, Good morning. How are you? Okay, now sit back down again. Do you know why I'm telling you to do this? It's the only time in a reference library you'll be able to talk, right? <laughs> Have you noticed how everybody's really quiet here? I just want to say, guys, I'm very, very sorry. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, National Library, thank you very much. Can I just say, your video at the beginning was very inspiring. I wanted to cry, but I thought that'd be very embarrassing. But it was really wonderful. I mean, ultimately, reference libraries are so important to the way that we learn. And when I was, you know, sorry, blatant plug, when I was writing my book, which is now in your library, um, it was a great source of information. So I want to thank you for that. And watch out for my next book that's coming out in February next year. Um, Six ideas to shape our cities. Do you recognize this person? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> this was when I was three years old. I'm not telling you my age now. But I was always getting down and dirty with the creepy crawlies in my mother and father's back garden. I grew up in England. My father's English. My mother's Malaysian. Hence the confusion of the look and the accent. And uh, where's Charlie? Charlie? You mentioned Brexit way too many times. <laughs> and Jason, you're not allowed to mention Brexit in all talk. <laughs> but basically, I fell in love with nature from a very young age. I was always making wigwam tents in the back garden, and uh, I've always been close to nature, which is why maybe the work that we do is somewhat related to green architecture and green cities. Around the time of three years old, this is what the Alaskan, the, uh, the Alaskan glaciers would have looked like. Okay. Now, by the time I went to the hallowed grounds of this wonderful university, Cambridge University, this is uh, Christopher Wren's library at Trinity College. This is what the Alaskan glaciers looked like. Okay, let me just go back. That was this fine-looking fellow at three years old. And that's what the Alaskan glaciers looked like. By the time I went to university, 18 years later, no, sorry, 15 years later, 16 years later, I, I said I wasn't going to mention my age. That's what the Alaskan glaciers looked like. I mean, leads us to say the passing of time has seen some rather cataclysmic shifts environmentally, and it's wonderful to hear Charlie speak about these four particular mega trends. And I would like to add to those two further ones of uh, culture being one of them and space depletion being another. So arguably, this frame for which we think about sustainability, this idea of this balance between social, economic, environmental issues, I think needs to be augmented with three further ones, space, culture, and technology. And I'll kind of explain a bit more about why I think these further 
three particular topics are important as we work through this presentation. Mark Mawinney was a remarkable, is a remarkable academic um, who spoke about sustainability being a bit of a balance theory. You've all heard of the triple bottom line of social issues, economic issues, environmental issues, and ultimately there needs to be this fine balance between the two, or the, between the three, because one cannot outweigh the others. But I would argue that that's quite a simple view of what sustainability is in the 21st century. Sustainability and the term sustainable development was first coined by Brundtland in 1987 in a report called Our Common Future for the United Nations. But arguably today, space, culture, and technology are also pressing issues. And so what I want to do is couch this presentation, these six ideas that act as, um, as prompts for thinking as opposed to kind of hardened rules. I hope we'll provide a bit more of an insight so that you can go away and scratch your heads later. So social, spatial, environmental, cultural, economic, and technological. Let's think about some of those burning issues. Rapid fire, social. Since 2007, half the world's population has been living in urban areas, and this will increase to 75% by 2050. Spatial, current world population density is 51 people per square kilometer, which is projected to be 66 people per square kilometer in 2050. Environment. While the world's cities only cover 2% of global land area, they account for a staggering 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. Culture is being challenged in the wake of assimilation, globalization, and technological advancement. Economy. Saudi Arabia has dedicated $2 trillion for investment in economic development and innovation to move away from fossil fuel reliance. Technology. If we want to continue enjoying life in cities and not live in dysfunctional urban habitats, then cities have to embrace technology in a more sustainable way. <sighs> and scene. Let's take a dial back a bit and think about why we have cities and the impact of those six ideas on how they've shaped cities. Traditional city of Rome. Can you tell me what looks different about this city of Rome here and this kind of simple plan of Portland in America? Any ideas? Space is smaller. OK. Anything else? Sorry, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I really don't want to come over and point to somebody. My university students hate it. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. That's the story of many cities, actually. The idea of influx from rural areas where people try and effectively find their opportunities for prosperity through these city centers. So yes. All you three are somehow getting to it. There is a bit of organic growth in Rome, but arguably the wonderful Romans gave us the Cardo and the, the Decaminus, the primary and secondary rows, they gave us the forum, and they gave us a bit of planning. There is this sense of people kind of moving from rural areas to city centers to seek their own elements of prosperity. Look at the open space. Look at the white. This is what we call a figure ground diagram. The white space is representing the streets and the squares. Okay? Look how much open space there was. Is that a laser pointer? No, it's not. I have to point to it. Look how much open space there was. The street and the square was an opportunity for our social interaction, our ability to meet, greet, hold a political rally, hold a religious sermon, trade. But by the 20th century, we moved from a city of beautiful open spaces and places for us to socially interact to gas-guzzling, air-conditioned, artificially lit glass boxes. The open spaces in the 20th century city have become arteries for our movement. 
And so ultimately we're seeing now then the network of global cities that do we need to be in that city at all? Do I need to be in a street or a square to socially interact, meet, greet, hold a political rally, hold a religious sermon, express my views? I can do that at the comfort of my laptop. I can do that in my own virtual city, my own virtual public space. Why have I got an image here of caveman and thinking man? Well, ultimately, when we're creating cities, when we're creating urban habitats, arguably, when we're creating anything, we often fall into two camps. We have those who love to do, and they want to do it very, very quickly. Hannah Arendt, the philosopher, said, animal laborans is the sort of person who just goes and gets the job done and worries about the consequences afterwards. Robert Oppenheimer was the guy behind the Manhattan Project, the creation of the H-bomb. And in the 1954 BBC Wreath Lectures, he was asked the question, well, you do realize that the H-bomb killed lots of people? And he said, well, yeah, but I was so fixated on this beautiful idea, this bit of kind of science, that I did not think about the consequences of my actions. Sometimes we become so fixated on getting something done and not really appreciate the impact of what we've done until later on. Then you've got those others, Homo Faber, the thinking person, who are constantly postulating, constantly thinking, never gets into the game. Yeah, there's no point sort of turning up for a baseball match if you're not going to take a few swings, right? Ultimately, in terms of our cities, this could be a sort of impact. You get it done, and you don't give a damn about the consequences until it's too late, and then you are really, really having issues. Or your wonderful utopian visions stay on paper, never get executed because you're too busy talking about it. I would like to think that there are opportunities for us to try and blend both of these worlds together. Really, the idea of having lateral sources of inspiration from which we can learn from, but at the same time being able to reinterpret past precedents and appreciate some of the lessons learned from the past. When I was at Cambridge, there was this wonderful series of lateral lectures that we would have in the evening, um, fireside chats, if you will. And we would often have speakers from outside of the architectural industry. And you know, we'll have, say, a composer coming to talk to us about the structure of the fugue. And we're thinking, what the hell is this? Seriously, what relevance is music to architecture? But when the composer was talking about structure and rhythm, it made us think, hold on a second. When we're creating a facade on a building, there is rhythm. When I'm walking through a space, as I'm walking through right now, I'm sensing there the rhythm of these seats and the way that they've been laid out. So there is rhythm and order in music, just as there is in architecture. So Peter Egan was the former chairman of Jaguar Cars. And one of his kind of lateral sources of inspiration for us in these fireside chats was this clear message. Why is it that I can roll a car off a production line with zero defects and your industry can't seem to open a building without many, many snags? Go figure. And I thought, well, yeah, that's absolutely right. So Peter Egan tried to influence the creation of Heathrow Terminal 5. Any of you flown through Heathrow Terminal 5? Heathrow Terminal 5 isn't a bad gig. I mean, years ago I was part of the design team and it was a very, very long process. And when we finished the building, we thought, do you know what? This is actually quite a modular building. You know, we've got the essence of what Sir Peter Egan was talking about. This is something that could almost be rolled off a production line and it will be zero defect. Day one, the baggage reclaim area broke down. I tell you, the French press loved it. But ultimately, 
there are always natural sources of inspiration that we can learn from, and they should be our guiding light to try and be slightly disruptive. Some of the greatest breakthroughs in, in cancer research right now are not necessarily coming from the medical field, they're coming from engineering. That's something that we thought about when we were creating the first zero carbon house in Asia. I'm talking about the one on the right, not the one on the left, by the way. Um, the one on the left is the Kampong House. What do we love about the Kampong House? Well, it was the first really zero carbon house. No reaching for the light switch, no reaching for air conditioning. It was all about natural light, natural ventilation, locally sourced materials, the ability for this thing to expand and contract according to the size of the family. Um, forgive my Malay, because clearly I can't speak Malay, but the Ruma Ibu and the Ruma Dapur. Ruma Ibu, the mother house. Ruma Dapur, the kitchen, correct? Yes, thank you. thank you. The ability to reinterpret past lessons to inform future architecture is what we're all about. So, that was an incredibly long introduction, and I'll keep this rapid pace so that your bums don't hurt in the seat. Six ideas to shape the urban habitat, and what I want to start with is society, and in particular, the social aspect of trying to embrace the great outdoors. Why? Once upon a time, we used to love walking out in public. We were all flaneurs. We all wanted to be looking good as we walked around in the outside world and shared pleasant conversation. But we're losing sight of those really simple ways of meeting and greeting. We are losing this element of civility. What would we rather do? We'd rather sort of say hi to somebody over WhatsApp or Twitter, or, or worse still, we might troll them. You know, it, it fills me with fear and dread in equal measure. Thank you for the phone. Um, it fills me with fear and dread in equal measure to think that we can be hiding behind technology. We need to embrace technology wisely and ensure that we do not lose sight of who we are, what we stand for, and the simple means of just saying, hey, how are you? Are you well? That's great. That's great. We are retreating into this virtual world, and I'm really scared about that, which is why in the project that we're doing uh, over in Kalang, it's about trying to get people to step out into the great outdoors again trying to get people to interact, socially engage. And interestingly enough, this is for Sports Singapore. Um, you'll recognize the National Stadium, you'll recognize the Singapore Indoor Stadium. And when we think about sport, have you thought about what a great social connector it is? It reminds me of, say, World War I times, uh, when, 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 the, when the British you know, jumped over the kind of trenches and met the Germans for a magnificent game of football on Christmas Day. Or in 1972, in the Olympics, when in the final basketball, the basketball final, sorry, the USSR played the USA. Putting aside political differences to come together, that wonderfully cohesive moment when somebody can kick a ball around or try and score a hoop. And so ultimately, looking at sport as a means of social cohesion, getting people to engage in the great outdoors is what this project is about. But at the same time, paying due respect to the culture of the place. Some of you will remember that this was once the site of an airfield. In the days of biplanes, airfields were circular. They could land from any direction because they were coming in at such a low speed. And so what you'll recognize is this loop that will effectively create a precinct. And that loop was the original boundary of this airfield. And this will effectively be the social connector that would allow the various people coming into the precinct to socially engage, run, jog, walk, cycle, and hopefully appreciate the great outdoor. Next one. Space. Use water as an alternative surface for urbanization. 35 mega cities of the world with over 10 million people are basically in flood risk conditions. They're in kind of flood risk environments. Any of you been to Venice? Right. You can always tell a Venetian they have dry feet. All of the tourists will have wet feet. If you go around November, December time, 
be sure that people with all the sort of the, uh, the, the plastic bags around their feet are there because they didn't time their journeys right. You can tell a Venetian, they'll take out their watch, they'll look at it and they'll say, ha, it's fine. Five minutes I'll be walking down this particular route and my feet will still be dry. Because in the morning, they're looking at their, um, their water level report. And so they may, may be able to sort of meander their way through the city and keep their feet dry. If you go to Miami South Beach by 2050, your feet will be very wet. It's remarkable that these 10 million people cities, these mega cities, are all within flood risk locations. So what we need to think about is how do you turn water into an asset? Water accounts for two-thirds of the surface area of the Earth. And ultimately, we need to be thinking about more dynamic solutions as opposed to static solutions. I still go to Venice every year to teach for a period of time. It still amazes me that we see people mopping out their you know, shops because of the flooding, but it's become part of their culture. But some people are not so lucky. When you think about Hurricane Sandy and the, you know, the financial you know, uh, impact of that particular uh, hurricane on New York City, it had a catastrophic insurance bill which basically brought about new climate change resilient, uh, resilience uh, issues and manuals to try and safeguard New York in the event of something else happening. Similarly, Higashi Matsushima in Japan. Higashi Matsushima was ravaged by the March 2011 tsunami. And what that effectively meant was that the whole city moved inland to ensure that it doesn't get hit again. I'll get to Higashi Matsushima a bit later, but the reason I'm showing you this is because water can be used as an alternative means of urbanization. I don't want to do this, but I will mention Boris Johnson. Right. He was actually a very good mayor of London, and he actually thought about rejuvenating one very old dock called the Royal Victoria Docks. The Royal Victoria Docks was the busiest port in, uh, in Europe prior to the Second World War. After the Second World War, the, the, the activities associated with that place shifted to Tilbury in Essex. The dock was then earmarked for regeneration and effectively became this new live, work and play community that was floating on the water. Unfortunately, Boris Johnson is no longer Mayor of London. He is the Prime Minister of, uh, of Great Britain. But some of his ideas have actually come true in certain parts of the world. We can see the Bangkok floating markets. We can see Chong Nas in Cambodia. And in Amsterdam, we have Eiberg, this floating community that effectively is a more affordable means of overwater living than if you're living in Amsterdam city centre. This is a scheme that we're currently uh, researching. I mean, basically, we designed this with the University of Venice, and we're looking to implement something very similar in Abu Dhabi. And these agricultural pods that you see here are all to do with reinforcing and reinterpreting some of the Venetian traditions of the past. Everybody assumes that Venice is this kind of urban museum of nostalgia that you go to visit St. Mark's Square and you grab a coffee in the, in the square and then you jump back on the boat and go somewhere else. <coughs> but there is more to Venice than that. Venice has a remarkable aquaculture tradition and an agriculture tradition at some of the periphery islands. And so what we wanted to do was create a new agri and aquaculture industry via these floating farms that would then be able to support a community in itself. This sort of self-sustaining community would then be buoyant and can rise up and down according to the climate change issues of sea levels rising. Hey, who knows, maybe it will come to Singapore one day. Environmental. Plan for a carbon negative future. What do I mean by carbon negative? I do not mean carbon zero. What I mean, I mean, 
kind of. Nice try. B minus, must try harder. Um, what I mean by this is that we want to try and act as a power station to support the community. Let me tell you, 86 million barrels of oil are consumed on a daily basis. That's like filling five pyramids of Giza. That is a lot of oil that is being depleted. And that's just to satiate our everyday needs. So what we need to think about is how do we shift to a more clean energy formed economy? When we think about Saudi Arabia's two trillion uh, US dollar investment into looking at alternative knowledge-based economies, we also need to think about how clean energy will be the future in order to try and safeguard our carbon woes and rather not add to them. So, ooh, can we play the video, please? What we need to be doing in terms of our urban habitat is to ensure that we test and model what our design assertions are. It's very easy for us in the creative industries, in, in, in designing buildings or cities, to put pen to paper and say, do you know what, I think this is sustainable. I think this is going to be able to reduce energy consumption and water consumption. Because ultimately, it's switching on the air conditioning or the artificial light that is adding to our carbon woes. But if we can go back to embracing natural light, natural ventilation, locally sourced materials, the things that our forefathers and mothers did, maybe that will help reduce our carbon footprint. Well, it will. And then to augment with clean energy technologies, whether that's solar, whether that's wind, whether it's geothermal, whether it's biomass, as a means of clean energy. In this house in Bukit Timah, the energy that was generated far exceeded the consumption of the family living in the home. And this can then be applied to whole communities where the surplus energy can be used as backup power in the case of a cataclysmic disaster. Going back to that point about Higashi Matsushima, 5,000 lives were lost during that tsunami. And obviously the Fukushima nuclear reactor meltdown did not make anything any easier. Now, this was a fundamental leap for the people of Higashi Matsushima to be able to come together as a community and lobby the government to say, do you know what? We lost 5,000 lives in this town and it's taken us a month to be able to get running water and electricity again and to get ourselves back up on our feet. And this lobbying and this community power effectively meant energy deregulation uh, in Japan. The five companies that effectively had a big energy monopoly basically said, you know what, you're right. There should be the ability for communities and townships to create their own energy, especially in the case of another cataclysmic disaster like the, uh, the tsunami that hit Fukushima. And so for us to start thinking about not just self-sustenance of our own home, but thinking about the community and the city that can then support the interests of those communities is going to be key in the future. And hopefully a move towards more energy deregulation. Next. Culture. Ensuring the built environment is adaptable to socio-cultural change. Brick Lane in London. This is a remarkable place. Now what I love about Brick Lane in London, East London, is that it has been the home to so many migrants over centuries. First of all, 18th century. French Huguenots escaping persecution from France came across into London and brought with them a lace industry. Lace, cotton, also their food was pretty damn good as well. And they created this church, this chapel, a French Huguenot chapel in the heart of Brick Lane. By the 19th century, the Jews came. The Jews brought their own cuisine. They brought an amazing bagel place. They also brought their cotton industry, their own banking. And they converted the chapel into a synagogue. By the 20th century, the Bangladeshis arrived, brought their own cuisine, their own cultures. They converted the synagogue into a mosque. 
unbelievable because what you have is this wonderful French Huguenot chapel, but it's been kind of ha having those added layers of history and this wonderful minaret that glows at night. And you've got layers of Protestantism, you know, Jewish faith, Islamic faith embedded into the bricks and mortar, each telling a story, a history, a cultural heritage of the place and its growth. That's something that we wanted to explore ourselves in Yangon. This is the Secretariat building uh, in Yangon. It is a British colonial administration building that smacks of that imperialism, I guess, of the past. But those layers of history still need to be preserved, but also the layers of history that talk about independence. Because this was the place that General Ong San was also assassinated. And so part of the layering of history and cultural identity is for us not to be scared of telling some of those time-tested rituals, those stories, those practices, and the ability to then think about not just the bricks and mortar, and this British colonial heritage, but to also talk about independence and also talk about some of the cultural sensitivities of Myanmar. What we love about Myanmar is that there is this... Um, anybody Burmese here, by the way? Anybody who can speak Myanmese? Yes, right. I'm going to say something to you. And please nod and say, yeah, I completely understand what you're talking about. <laughs> Just to fool the rest of the audience. Um, Pan Si Miao. I knew it. It was completely made up. No. Um, Pan Si Miao, the 12 noble handicrafts. Pan P A N S Y M Y O. Oh, how dare you? Uh, you're not familiar with this. Uh, don't worry, I'll come and tell you afterwards. Um, they're the 12 noble handicrafts. Blacksmithing, silversmithing, stonework, masonry. And what we wanted to do is not just preserve the British colonial structure in its former glory, but also talk about the nation building out of the assassination of General Aung San and the fact that it became an independent country, but also the handicrafts, the cultural heritage and traditions of the place. Even when it comes down to the graphics of picking up the colours of the patane, which is the, uh, the, the, the umbrellas that are kind of shaped and crafted in Myanmar, or the saffron robes that are worn by some of the worshippers. So the secretariat in Yangon. Right, moving swiftly on. Economy. Design for a digital-based economy. Now, this small company on the right-hand side called Amazon, you might have heard of them, um, they have really looked at the culture of the workplace in a very, very unique way. What they realize is that the modern culture of the workplace isn't about all of us sitting rank and file at a workstation, but it's far more about social interaction, knowledge sharing, collaboration. Ultimately, the shift from a manufacturing economy to a technologically based economy to a digital economy is all about knowledge and knowledge sharing arguably no different to the hallowed grounds of Cambridge, where one would be able to share those insights and ideas to try and create new innovations and solutions. In Alice building that we, we designed in Mediopolis, we were effectively trying to create this vertical working ecosystem where people would be able to take collaborative space dotted through the building and hopefully rub shoulders with those unicorns who have actually made it, share ideas, share new practices. And effectively, you're creating this closed-loop ecosystem where you've got those individuals who may not necessarily be able to afford office space, but they do have an idea, and they have a strong one. And it might be even better if they're meeting other people, other like-minded people, to rub those ideas together and hopefully shape their own companies or new products or new innovations and hopefully then grow. So ultimately, this building acts as a bit of an incubator for those ideas, from novice through to master. And so creating a mix of different uses with collaborative working spaces, digital working spaces, that foster that sense of connection between the workers, between the novice to the master, is what was key to this development. 
and finally technology. Embrace mobility to enhance our lives. Now, I had the privilege of doing a TV series called Smart Cities 2.0, where I went to different cities around the world to look at what made them smart, what made them sustainable, and whether technology was really the enabler. Everybody's assumption about a smart city is that it's all about the technology. They also think, well, aren't these smart cities very, very government-driven initiatives, very top-down, as opposed to people-driven and bottom-up? Well, yeah, I mean, ultimately, that's what the TV series was meant to find. But what we can see is that it's not always about the technology. It's about using technology sparingly and wisely. In the case of Amsterdam, what I love is the fact that I've only got five minutes. Yes, thank you very much. Um, what I love about Amsterdam is that they've taken their canal network and they've tried to utilize this as a means of heightened mobility. Everybody loves to cycle there and walk there or take the train. But these autonomous boats will allow you to step on, move around the canals and jump off whenever you want. These autonomous boats could also be clipped together to form new bridges through the city. Shenzhen. Shenzhen invests a lot into new technologies. The number one investor in new tech and new startups is the USA. Number two, Shenzhen. Isn't that crazy? One country followed by one city. And so Shenzhen is arguably the Silicon Valley of hardware. It is a remarkable place where there are so many opportunities for people with a bright idea to come and make things happen, like bees to honey, ZTE, WeChat, DJI drone technology, all of that came out of Shenzhen. And those ideas not only get exported overseas and make Shenzhen prosperous, but those ideas are also captured in the city and help improve the livelihoods and the livability of the people living there. I'll skip a couple. I'll go to Barcelona. Barcelona is the home to seven UNESCO World Heritage Sites, the wonderful architecture of Anthony Gaudi, also the golden boots of Lionel Messi. And what we see about Barcelona is the fact that it was a wonderfully planned city in the 19th century, but with the automobile, it became this gridlocked city. A gridlocked city that had one of the highest pollution rates in Europe. But through the ingenuity of the mayor and the local administration, they basically created super blocks where particular roads were closed off to make them pedestrianized. And they filled them with green open spaces, with trees and cafe culture, effectively giving the space back to the people, encouraging greater social interaction and helping reduce the carbon footprint of the city and also take noxious pollutants out from the city because of the greater amount of greenery that was put into these new pedestrianized boulevards. And ultimately, I think that smart cities are very much now driven through people as opposed to the powers that be. Smart cities are increasingly about trying to engage with the people, and arguably it is the people that shape the brief of the smart city. I want to finish on these four points. What you've seen so far is effectively my prompts for thinking of how we could be shaping better urban habitats. But it is not the will of one individual. It all starts with the people. It can't be a government-driven, top-down approach. The most successful places are driven through the brief and the words of the people who want to express their needs. Academia can test those ideas, provide opportunities for proof of concept, and establish the need and the viability, which can then be augmented and funded by private sector, who can contribute to seeing the benefits of those ideas and innovations being applied in the city, which can then be ratified by government. Arguably, the smart city views 
the smart city visions of many a global city now, are not just about being a government-driven idea, but it really does need the buy-in of these four spheres of influence. And once you've done that, there's always this thing called peer pressure. When you go home and look over the garden fence or look at your neighbor, you'll always be thinking, oh, what have they got? What have they done? And sometimes it's peer pressure that keeps us motivated and keeps us going. And ultimately, my friends, that's wrapping up my session. I just want to thank you for your patience. And uh, I look forward to answering your question in a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pomeroy.